Cool. Um, so, my sequel. It's one of those things that, in all likelihood, you know, probably almost everyone here has been using it for years. When you first start learning, you, you know, got a tutorial online, or you know, if, when I did it, bought a book. Um, they always go, right, so you can create a form with PHP, and then you can persist data. And you go, okay, so I need to learn my SQL. If you're like me, you probably learnt it then, and you've never really thought about it again. You go, well, okay, I can insert data, I can select data. You know, a couple of years ago, I even learned how to build an index. Um, but you've not necessarily kept up to date with it, which is, which is kind of odd, because you look at the IDEs you, we use, you look at the frameworks we use, we're always kind of keeping up to date and thinking about what's new, what, what are the new features that are coming out, you know, how's this tool going to make our lives better? But kind of MySQL can, can sometimes be forgotten. Before I go on, I just want to say a really quick thank you uh, to the organizers. This is my first time in Poland in general. Um, it's beautiful. Um, and it's my, certainly my first time speaking at, at one of the conferences that, that these organizers have arranged. So they've done a great job. Obviously, it's a, a stunning venue. It's a great backdrop. They've had some really quality speakers. If you've not had a chance to do so, please take any of the organizers aside and just you know, give them a quick thank you. It does mean a lot to hear it, how well that these things are run and that the attendees really appreciate it. So who am I? Um, my name is Liam Wiltshire, as it says there. Um, I'm actually not a senior PHP developer and business manager anymore. Uh, I've not updated this slide. Uh, I'm actually a CTO uh, for a company called... <laughs> There's only three developers, it doesn't count. <laughs> for a company called Tebex. Now, you may not have heard of us. Uh, we're a company based in the UK, in Nottingham. Um, as I say, we're still based in Europe. Um, and we um, provide monetization solutions for people that host games, uh, or host servers on games like some of these. Just really cool. My kids think it's ace because I get to speak to these YouTubers. I've got no idea who they are. Uh, but yeah, they think it's cool, so eh, whatever. Um, so when I've done this talk in the past, or I've, I've spoken to people about the fact I do a MySQL talk, everyone says the same thing. Everyone knows MySQL, right? And yeah, you know, if, if you just use it for what you use it for, then you, know, you probably know. You know how inserts work, you know how selects work, you know how updates work. Um, but sometimes, you know, we perhaps don't think about uh, the other things it can do. Sometimes we don't use MySQL at all. You might be using Mongo or Postgres. Postgres is ace, by the way. Um, but, you know, any time you look at it, you're probably going to come back to MySQL for something. And often we go back to the same old tools and we don't necessarily think about, actually, is there a way that it can make our lives better? So what we're going to do over the next kind of 45 minutes or so is look at some features that you might not know about. Now, some of them are fairly new, um, brand new, in fact. Some of them are a little bit older, but perhaps you've overlooked them. Um, if any of you know all of these features and use all these features, then by all means, steal my slides and go and do this talk for me next time. Saves a lot of effort. Uh, where possible, I've provided version numbers for some of these features. Please note these are the MySQL version numbers. So, you know, a lot of things like Mario and Pocona will have similar features. They might work slightly differently, or they might come in different versions. So any of the version numbers are, are MySQL specific. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is one that hopefully you are using a little bit of, but perhaps you don't necessarily know all the, the details, and it's that MySQL now, now has no SQL features. Woo! I could just leave the talk there. I mean, that's the only one that's really important. Uh, um, we now have a, a native JSON type. That's a big deal. It's something that Postgres has had forever. Um, they had one that was rubbish, and then they had JSONB, which was actually you know, fixed all the problems. It was great. But we now have a, a JSON type like things like blobs and, and, and that sort of thing, the data is stored in a binary format. The reason that's good is that you're no longer having to parse the text each time you want to read it or write to it or you know, do queries on it. It's all stored in, in, in a binary format, uh, which makes the whole thing a heck of a lot quicker. Um, and it, like I said, it means you can do kind of more complex queries and that sort of thing. Like the other binary columns, you can't currently add indexes to it. It's something that is being worked on, uh, but there are some alternative solutions to that anyway. Um, so here's a, a really basic example. Um, I'm going to insert into a talk, into talk. So we've got a, a table that's got an ID, because we're all using UUIDs now, right? 
I'm not. Uh, we're always in UUIDs, so it's binary 16, because that's how we store UUIDs. Um, incidentally, actually, MySQL 8 has a UUID to binary method now uh, that does that stuff, uh, where we're unhexing and generating UUID and, and turning it into a, uh, a binary column. Uh, that's not one of the features. That doesn't count, but it's cool to know. Uh, and then we're going to insert some, some JSON. OK, fine. Um, now, the next thing we're going to want to do is get some data back out of it. Inserting, that's easy enough. You're just passing what looks like a string that represents a JSON object, job done. When we're dealing with JSON, there are quite a few different ways you can get data back out, uh, and they all work slightly differently, which is a little bit annoying. Um, they've got things like the, the JSON underscore functions. You've got JSON contains, JSON extract, and, and so on. Um, and then you also have some, some shortcut methods. The thing that's always worth remembering is this dollar symbol. Uh, which, you know, seems to be using everything. I mean, jQuery used to use it. Uh, still does use it if you're using jQuery. Uh, we use it for variable representation. In MySQL and JSON, that means the document root. That's representing the root of the document. So in this instance, as it says here, we're going to look for any rows that have the title adventures in MySQL. So you see, this in itself is a JSON object. We're creating an object that says, right, it has one key of title and a value of adventures in MySQL. Uh, and then we're saying, is there any, any rows that contain that object as a sub-object of the parent object of that thing? So that's fine. Finally, rows have any summary. So again, like I said, the, the dollar is the document root. So it has a direct child of the, of the, the document root that is not null. Um, or we can just grab all the titles from all the talks in the database. Quite straightforward, right? You can also use it to, to get deeper into uh, the, the document. So again, we've created this JSON document that now has a, a talk data, and then the title and summary are within it. Um, and again, so exactly the same as here, we can say, right, OK, so we're going to grab where um, we've got this title object, uh, and we're getting it from the, the talk data. Or again, write it the same way, the document root, talk data, title. So again, going down that tree and looking for that title. One thing to be aware of is because everything that gets returned is a JSON object in itself, or is JSON in itself, I should say, um, by default, strings that you get back will have quotes around them because that makes them valid JSON. If you just had a, a piece of text with no quotes, then it's not valid JSON, so it wouldn't work. Um, so here, when I, we grab this title, notice how it has got uh, quotes at the start and end. Um, there's a JSON unquote method to get those out. Um, so you can wrap JSON unquote around the whole thing, but that's ugly. The other way to do it is we've got this little double arrow thing. Um, basically, they run out of symbols. <laughs> so we've got data. Now we're using this double-headed arrow to get um, dollar dot title, and now that goes right. I'm going to unpack it so it's no longer a JSON representation. I'm going to unpack that into an actual string that you can use because otherwise the extra quotes are a bit of a pain in the ass. One other thing that is the thing that really, I think, people sometimes miss is that you can actually, as well as using it to, to pull out JSON so you're storing it, you can actually get MySQL to generate its own JSON. Um, so in particular, there are a couple of aggregation methods, uh, one called JSON object ag, which aggregates into an object, and one called JSON array ag, and I'm sure you can guess what that does. Um, so these allow you to take multiple rows. So if you've, got a, if you've done a query and you're going to get a number of rows, you can then use that to cast that into a JSON object or a JSON array, like we're going to do here. So if you imagine I've got a, I work in the gaming industry, so we've got a table of games and high scores. So you can imagine this, what this table would look like. You've got a column of games and then, again, then a column for the username and then a column for the high score. So you might have some Minecraft ones and then some Pac-Man ones and then some Rust ones and Arc ones and whatever. Just in one big table, they've just been dumped in, uh, however. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, right, pull out the game, but then I want you to create a, a key value pair, essentially a, a JSON object with the username as the key and the high score as the value. We're going to call it players from the high scores table, that's what this is, and we're going to group by game. So like any other group, you'll get one row for each group, so all the, the Pac-Man rows, if you like, you get one, one record that they've all grouped, and then all the, the Minecraft rows and so on. But the actual the values within that, the, key, the player names and the high scores, get turned into a JSON object. 
So you get all that data basically squashed into, into a JSON in one row. So we're going to assume that Notch was never very good at Pac-Man, because you know, he wasn't born. Uh, but Clyde, funnily enough, was quite good. And likewise, Clyde's never really played Minecraft, so he wasn't great, but Notch kind of wrote the game, so he's all good. So it's really cool, like I said, you can turn that multiple rows into a JSON object that you can then use however you want to use it, uh, which is quite nice. Then we're going to go on to talking about geometry in space. Uh, apparently we are here. Don't know where here is. Um, so this, is, this has actually been in for a, a little while. Um, so since MySQL 5.5, we've had OpenJS support. To be perfectly honest, when it first came out, it wasn't very good. Uh, it was a bit of a nightmare to use. And, and even now, there are some things where actually, if, there are, if there's another way that you can do it, often it's better to do that. But if you're working with things like polygons and, and lines and points and things to do, to do geographic calculations, um, it does do a pretty good job now. Um, you can now add indexes to um, geo representations of, let's say you've got a column that has data points, like you've got a, a store locator and you've got lat longs for each place that, where there's a store. You can now index that for better performance. So that's a big deal. Um, and there are a number of other functions that we'll go through. Um, again, consider your use case. If you've only got five stores, if you've got a small chain of, say, supermarkets, and there are only five stores, you're probably quicker off just doing it in PHP to find the closest. But if you've got hundreds of them that you would otherwise have to loop, loop through, then actually at that point, doing it with MySQL with the indexes will probably be more complicated to get started, but more performant afterwards. So. There are a number of data types that are, that are particularly related to this. So we've got this geometry data type, which is basically a catch-all. You can stuff any geometric values in there. Um, and then within that, you have the specifics, which are a point, a line string, or a polygon. So a point is, is a point, a, a lat-long pair, essentially. A line string is just a series of points. And then a polygon is multiple points that make up a pretty shape. Um, so that's all good. Again, these are stored in binary. Um, so then, if you, you know, although you would put in lat longs or whatever kind of geographic representation, they're not stored that way. They are stored in binary, which is why they are indexable and, and searchable and sortable and all those sorts of things. You can also turn them into collections. So you can have a collection of points. You can have a collection of line strings and a collection of polygons. I've never really had a use case for that, but it's there. Um, so this is something that's slightly newer originally, which is really unhelpful. When the OpenGIS support came to MySQL, it only supported flat planes. So you could map points like on this table. You could go, right, I've got a point there and a point there, and it would work out the distance and all that stuff. But that's no good if you're on a globe, because if no one's noticed, it's kind of round. Um, so in, in MySQL 5.7, they went, actually, you know what? We've done this all backwards. No one needs a flat plane. Let's, let's, let's give you some spheres. Um, now, by default, that um, talks about the, the distances. So you can provide an argument to the ST distance sphere, for example, that gives you the radius of the sphere that you're talking about. If you don't pass it, then it assumes the distance of the Earth, um, which obviously, unless you're Elon Musk and you're you know, doing mapping on Mars, then it's probably fine for most of us. <laughs> but you can change it. So you know, once, te once uh, SpaceX gets there, they can run all their mapping in MySQL and be fine. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. So we've created, I've created a table for conferences. Again, there's just a, an ID and a, a name. And then this location point. So it's that point data type. It's only going to be a single point. We're assuming that these aren't like multi-venue conferences, because then you need a collection or something. Um, I'm going to insert some. So PHP Tech, which is in Atlanta, and Sunshine, which is Florida. Um, and then we're going to say, right, this is the location that I'm currently at. Um, and I want you to show me how far I am from each of these conferences. So get me a distance on a sphere from this point that represents my current location to each location in this data space. And you'll get something that looks completely unhelpful. Um, yeah, I mean, good luck. Perhaps, perhaps you can figure that out. We'll go, there you go. So there's your locations, um, apparently. Uh, and then a distance in meters, which is annoyingly slightly cropped off on this, on this display. Uh, but there we are. Obviously, that's not that useful. Um, so you can then turn them back into JSON. Um, it also supports WKTs, it says there. Uh, but most of the time, we're web developers. We're probably going to convert it to JSON, right? Um, 
And again, so that point, when I grab them from the conferences, I'm going to get it. It's going to tell me it's a point, and these are the coordinates. So that's really cool. Next question. Who here has done uh, master-slave replication or master-master replication, that sort of thing? A few of you? Who thinks it's a king nightmare? <coughs> yeah, exactly. Not anymore. Woo! GTID, rep GTID replication. Uh, instantly, this is a, a little comic, completely side, called Commit Strip. Um, I think they've written in French originally, and they get translated to English as well. Um, so this is someone talking about replication in MySQL and how no one really knows how it works. Uh, it's called Commit Strip, well worth checking out. Historically, doing uh, master-slave replication in MySQL was a bit of a pain. Um, so you'd have your master, and then you'd turn on binary logging, and then you'd go to your slave and be like, right, start replicating from this point in the file. And if something went wrong, it would lose track of where it was in the file, and then you have to go, right, no, start again. Here's a dump. Now start from this point in the file. And then it would get lost again, and then it would never work, and it would break all the time. It, it was pretty brittle. Uh, if you ever got it running for more than about six months, then I'd take my hat off to you. Um, but it was, it, was, it was not ideal. So now we have these GTIDs, which I cannot remember what they stand for. Globally, tr uh, global transaction ID, that's right. Um, basically, every single transaction that you have within a cluster will have a unique reference. One of those. Which then means that by telling, you can then basically share what GTID you're currently on, and it makes the whole replication process a lot more robust. Um, it's fairly straightforward to set up, actually. Um, so you have to turn GTID on, uh, and then enforce its consistency. So now it's going, the GTID, uh, GTID is the master record. That's the thing that we're saying, you listen to that. If it tells you your uh, transaction ID X, that's where you are. Uh, and then you change, you set up your replication to say, right, use this master host, and the user and everything else, and this important bit, auto position equals one. None of that bin log, uh, bin, log uh, bin log current position or whatever it was, I can't remember, where you had to then provide the number and by the, which point it's changed and whatever. You just say, right, you figure it out. I don't care. You know what? You go and talk to the master. You work out where we've got to and go. And that's it. And you get the master status and it'll say, right, this is the last GTID that was uh, executed. When you do your MySQL dumps, um, there's a, an extra flag, I now can't remember what it is, that sets the transaction ID position, uh, the GTID position of that dump. So you take your dump with the transaction ID, you put that into your slave, it automatically knows where it currently is. So it can then go to the master, well, this is where I am, and the master can go, well, I'm, you know, even if it's six months ahead, it can go, well, I'm now at this ID, these are all the transactions that have happened in the meantime, go and sort it out. And it just, it just does it all itself, it's brilliant. I get quite excited. <laughs> Even now, I've used it for a few years, and even now I look at it and go, this is amazing. <laughs> it makes me happy. Um, so, explain. I don't know if you've noticed, explain's not that new. It's kind of been around a little while, you know, MySQL 2. Um, but they've added some pretty cool new features to it. Um, so, for MySQL 5.6, you can now do explain on write queries. So originally, you could only use explain on, on read queries, or selects, in other words. Um, now you can do it on updates and deletes and, and insert selects and that sort of thing. Obviously, doing it on a, a, a straight update, or sorry, a, a straight insert probably won't give you much information, because you're not using indexes to do an insert. That's not how it works. But if you're doing something else like an update, so something that has a where clause or a delete or that sort of thing, you can now do these, I said explain. So this is an insert select, which again, before you wouldn't have been able to do. And it'll go, well, actually, I know I'm going to be doing a select, and this is the details, and then I'm going to do an insert, and they're all null because I'm writing to a text file. It's not difficult. Um, so that's pretty cool. Way more exciting, though, is, I hope you all agree, we need more JSON in our lives. We don't have enough of it. I could, I could have JSON all day, it's all good. Um, and we need more. And now there's an explain format. So you can now say to explain, um, actually, I don't want it as a, as a table like that, that previous one. I want you to give it to me in, in JSON format. Partly that's cool because you could then perhaps put that into an automated tool to, if you've got slow queries, you could automate the explain and then parse out the JSON and you know, build reports on it or something. That'd be, that'd be pretty cool, right? Um, but actually, the way more interesting bit is it gives you loads more data. There's only so much data you can fit in a table, uh, 12 columns, incidentally. Um, but you could, it gives you a lot more information about kind of the, and any extensions, which partitions it's using, if you're doing partitioning, that sort of thing. 
Um, so again, it's not much different. You're just dumping in this explain format equals JSON. Um, notice I'm using our, our new JSON table. Um, it's all good. Um, and that gives you a load of stuff like this. So all the old data is in there, all your, you know, the types of queries, um, the query costs, things like that. But it goes into a lot more information about, you know, costs of everything, the stuff that you, you could get from extended select. Um, and like I said, it'll have more as well if you're doing things like partitioning your tables. It'll give you all that information as well. Um, so again, here's a, another example. And, and again, just gives you more data in a, in a processable format, opens up a lot of opportunities for automating a lot of this stuff. If you've got you know, slow queries enabled, you pick up and there's a slow query, you can run this, work out why it's slow, basically build automated reports that someone then can then go in and fix the, the causes of the slowness. So that's pretty cool. Uh, user roles. Uh, another good comic. Anyone uh, who doesn't know the XKCD comics, they're well worth checking out. This, proves, this is the point that if you're on Linux anyway, if, I've got, if you've only got my user account, yes, you can access my bank account. Yes, you can probably access my Twitter because I probably haven't logged it out. Yes, you can access my Gmail and my PayPal, but at least you can't install drivers. <laughs> <laughs> so, user roles. Um, th they're kind of what they say on the tin. What, you, ne what you, you couldn't do previously in MySQL is say that there was a group of users that all had the same set of permissions. If you wanted to add users for different, say, developers on your team to your MySQL database, be that production or staging, you'd have to add them individually and then individually set up the permissions. And if you wanted to change the permissions at some point, you then have to go and change it on every single user account, and it was a bit rubbish. Um, so we now have these user groups, uh, these user roles. So you can basically create these groups of users. You can say, right, I now have a developer role, and I have a administrator role, and I have a I know, statistics and analyst role or whatever. Uh, and then you give the permissions to those roles. So you can say that you know, the, the admin has everything, the statistics analyst just has select because they shouldn't be touching, they shouldn't be writing data, and then the developers have got select and update and, and whatever. Um, and, but then, rather than having to add those privileges to every user, you can just go, right, these users, so user A, B, and C are now all developers, user E and F are admins and, and whatever. So you only have to set the roles once and then you can take users out, add new users in if someone leaves or a new person joins your team or whatever. Uh, and basically just speeds up a lot of that manually creating users with privileges and, and all that sort of thing. So it looks just like this. You can create these roles. You then, instead of granting to a user, we're now granting to the developer role and the analytics role. And then you give the developer role or the analytics role to the individual users. So it just basically just shortens up some of that, that process of adding lots of, lots of users with different permissions. Another cool thing, generated columns. Now, generated columns have been around since uh, 5.6. What they allow you to do is basically define an expression um, that generates a new column in, in your table on the fly. Um, so let's say, for example, you've got a first name and a last name in two separate columns, and in some cases you need the combined name. Okay, yes, you could do it in PHP, of course, uh, but actually the other way you can do it is you can have a generated column that says, right, define this generated column as concat, first name, and a space, and last name, and it'll give you a new, what looks like a column, you don't have to insert into it, it just gets built on the fly, that has the concatenated first name, last name. That's kind of nice. Um, another use for it would be to index things that are otherwise unindexable. So again, we had that JSON column before that we said we can't have indexes on. Well, let's say you actually went, well, actually, I need an index just on, say there's a slug field in there. Uh, and for whatever reason, it wasn't created as its own column. It's part of this JSON, but now we need it to be separate. You could have a generated column that says, pull out the slug. Um, and then we can index that generated column. So we have this column with the slug in it by itself, but we don't have to insert it a second time. It's still part of the JSON object. Uh, but this column is now indexable, and then when we want to do a select on that, it will use the index, and everyone's happy. So, again, here's a, a little example. So, uh, we've, as we said, there's no index, so at the moment, if I want to get the title, you know, I have to do uh, a full scan of the whole table, and parse every JSON object, and see if the title's in there, and whatever. We can add this generator column. Uh, so we're going to say, we're going to call it talk title. Uh, and it's going to extract the data 
the, the title attribute from, from the JSON document. Um, and it's stored. So what that means is it's generated at write time, not read time. Um, we'll come on to that in a minute. Then we're going to add an index to this new column. And now we can do a query on that new imaginary column. And it'll use an index. And all of a sudden, rather than taking six months to bring back a result, it'll happen straight away. And everyone wins. There are two types of generated column. Uh, there's a virtual generated column, and then there's what we call a stored generated column. Now, the example before was a, a stored generated column, uh, but virtual ones, essentially the difference is that virtual ones happen at read time. So when you do a select and it brings back your records, it will then generate the column. Um, I think with InnoDB, you can still do an index on a, generated a virtual generated column, although I have no idea how that works. I guess it works it out and stores it in an index, but then regenerates it at select time or something. I don't really know. Um, but no, as a normal rule, the column will be generated when you do a, a select. Uh, when you do a, a select. Um, so you do your query on your other columns, and then again, like with the, the name example, pulling in the, the first name and the last name concatenated, it would get your record set, then do the concatenation, and then return the whole thing as your result. Store generated columns on the other hand, happen at write time. So when you do an insert or you do an update, it'll work out the value of the column at that point uh, and then store it. So it gets stored as, as a physical piece of data in your table. You just don't have to do the insert for it. Um, doesn't obviously have any performance impact at read time because it's happening when you do the write and it makes it obviously easy to index and that sort of thing. But if you've got lots of generated columns, obviously you'll end up with very fat tables. So do be a little bit careful with that. Offline mode. I could do an offline mode. Um, so offline mode, in short, basically turns off your database without turning it off. That made about as much sense as... Anyway, um, so what it basically does is say, right, only people that have the super user privilege can now access this database. Um, it's quite good to, be, to do things like maintenance, because you don't have to restart the database or anything like that. If you just need to stop people querying it for... 10 minutes while you, you know, run some massive ass migration that's going to break everything. Otherwise, we've all been there. You have, you know, have your little holding page, whatever, but you, it's useful. You know, it, having a holding page is fine, and you'll go, right, we've got a holding page. People can't access the control panel. But if you've got APIs, people could still be hitting the database from a route that perhaps you've forgotten about. This is just that additional safety check to go, actually, no one can touch this database while I'm running my migration. Um, so it's, it's useful for doing that sort of thing. Like I said, it's this extra failsafe. It's pretty easy, set global offline mode on. I mean, can't get much more straightforward than that. Indexes. We have some new, new things around indexes. Uh, in MySQL 8, um, a thing called invisible indexes has been introduced. Now, basically, the, the problem it solves is testing the impact or lack of impact of an index. Um, if you imagine, you know, over time we we'll write all these queries and, and then we go, oh, this, this query is slow, oh, we'll stick an index on it. And then an, a little while later, another, index, another query is slow, oh, we'll stick another index on that. And you, one day you do show indexes from user, there's like 50 indexes on a 12 column table. And you go, this is a bit wrong. <laughs> this shouldn't be like this. What am I doing? I'm going to quit and become a, I don't know, cleaner, I don't know, whatever. Um, so, yes, I completely lost myself there. Um, so you probably go, I know I can probably get rid of some of these indexes, but I don't know which ones I can get rid of. Uh, and what if, um, invisible indexes essentially does is allow you to turn them off temporarily. Um, so they will still be maintained. So if you do an insert that would affect that index, that index will still be updated. But when you do a select, as far as the uh, query optimizer is concerned, that index doesn't exist. So you can basically turn the indexes off, if all of a sudden some query dies, you go, shit, turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. Uh, but actually, if it doesn't affect anything, you can go, right, I can now safely drop that index and no worries. So it's like a, a pr almost like a staging for deleting queries, I guess. Um, again, it's pretty easy to use. Here's an index, make it invisible. And, oh, that didn't work, make it invisible again, please. And it's all good. Uh, another part of indexing that you can do now uh, is descending indexes. So up until MySQL 8, um, I think Pocono has had it a little bit longer. I'm not sure about MarioDB. Um, indexes were always stored ascending. So if you know, 
you know how an index effectively works. It's like a, a sorted lookup table. So if you want to, you've got an index on a time column, the, the top of the index will be the, the time the longest to go, and the bottom will be the most relevant one, which is fine. That's the whole way an index works, because it knows where to look. That's how they work. Uh, and then they have trees and stuff as well. Um, but if you want, if you're, let's say you're doing a sort, and you want the newest ones first, like, I don't know, a blog, then it has to reverse the entire index to then be able to get the ones in the correct order, which is, I mean, it's fine, but it's an extra step that we don't need. So now, here's that example, in fact, that exact example we'd use. The whole point of this now, um, that up until being able to do that, that took extra time. You had to either flip it over or in 5.7 do a reverse scan up the index, which isn't the way that disk reads work. They don't like going backwards. And it, was, it, well, just, it wasn't as effective as it could be. So instead now, we can add these indexes um, and tell it that this index index the date column descending. Or, yeah, descending. So the, the newest one will be at the top. So now when we're doing that same query as we did before, where we want them sorted by date descending, because we're doing the news or a blog and the, the newest post should be at the top, it doesn't have to do all that reverse sorting or flipping the index on its head or doing a little jig or whatever it was doing before. It can just read the index, which makes life, again, it's just nicer. So there's 10 features. That's what this talk was about. 10 features of MySQL that hopefully you're at least not using some of them. But there was one that I didn't know about. Um, like the SNES, it's pretty old now, but it's a classic. So I didn't know about this until a couple of years ago. I had no idea. I've been blissfully skipping through developer life, destroying databases as I go, and I never knew. The I am a dummy flag. So the I am a dummy flag, you can if you want to be less offensive. It, there's also a boring flag called dash dash safe mode. Pfft. Or safe updates, sorry. Uh, safe updates, but I'm a dummy's way funnier. <laughs> what it essentially does is if you try and run an update or a delete or any writing query that doesn't use a where clause with a key, it won't let you. <laughs> I mean, the number of times, I've, I mean, I've done it on production. Before I knew about this, I thought I was on my staging box Incidentally, another thing that you can do if you've got the, command, uh, the MySQL command line is you can change the prompt to show which host you're on. So I learned about that after this mistake as well. Uh, I thought I was on staging, and I wasn't. I was on production. And I wanted to see what happened if you... I needed to update the price of some products in our test database to $5. You can see where this is going. <laughs> so I, I was there, merrily typing away, update, where uh, yeah, price, uh, update, set price equals 5. Hit enter, and went, shit, I've not put a where clause on it. So like, oh, it's fine, it's only, only staging. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> wasn't staging. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun day, that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Um, and then I learned about this and went, actually, OK, it would have updated some, but at least I would have only updated like a record, not 14 million records. <laughs> so I am a dummy. And it works basically like this. Um, create, you know, start with MySQL. I'm going to connect to a local DB um, without a password, because that's nice and secure. Um, test DB with this, I am a dummy flag. And it still connects as normal. I've gone, right, I'm going to update users, set email equals test at test.com. I hit return and go, oh shit. Try and cancel out, no, it's not having it. But it's fine. Because we set I am a dummy, because I am, you're using safe mode, uh, safe update mode, and you try to update a table, and it basically throws an error and doesn't do anything, which then means I can basically have a little party. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a. It's one of those things, and a lot of the kind of, if you're using a, a GUI client instead, a lot of them have a similar thing. I know Workbench has a, a safe updates toggle, very much the same as this does. I'm sure some of the other ones do as well. I just am a bit old school and use a command line because, I don't know, I like being inefficient, I guess. So there we go. Um, we use a wide range of technologies, okay? From frameworks to the different storage engines that we can use, to different languages, to being able to use C libraries within PHP, if you are in the talk earlier. Um, and it's very easy to fall behind on the latest wave of what's shiny and new. Certainly when you've then got JavaScript frameworks going, look at me instead, woo! It's, it's, like, it's, it's easy to get distracted. So 
sometimes you have to take stock and go, actually, what are the core tools we use? Just because they've worked forever, there's probably new things, not just in MySQL, but, but in your IDE or whatever else it is that you're using. You know, any of those features might, a lot of them you'll go, well, actually, that doesn't really apply to our use case. But any of them might go, well, this makes our lives a little bit easier. This makes our application a little bit faster. We'll just make your quality of developer life or your customer's quality of life using your application that little bit better. This is just a section of some of the features um, that, that I've used and particularly got excited about because I'm quite sad about things like this. Um, but there are lots of others, like I said, not just in, in MySQL, but, but in any of the tools you're using. So every now and again, you know, have a dip into the, the, the mailing list, have a dip into the change logs, and, and go and explore. Thank you very much. <laughs> so before we do any questions, if there are any, hopefully not, Please, 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 please do leave feedback on all the talks you've seen. So this conference and lots of other PHP conferences around the world use a tool called Joined In. I used to be a maintainer. Um, I stood down from that about a year ago. And now a way more qualified group of individuals are maintaining it than I ever was. Um, and they don't break it all the time, so it's all good. Um, so do go and leave you know, any feedback. If it's that you thought it was excellent, great. If you thought it was shite and you've got some ideas on how I can make it better, also great. Um, and likewise, go and leave feedback for, for any of the talks you've seen, um, and we do appreciate it. As part of that, if you want to get the slides, because that's quite often a question that comes up, they are only on Joined In. I will not post them directly. You have to go through Joined In to get the slides. So while you're there, <laughs> any questions? Oh. All right, everyone duck, because I've proven I can't throw this. Hello. Oh, hey. great. Thank you. Um, can you suggest any source um, of information to keep up with changes in MySQL other than, uh, I don't know, developers change log or uh, release notes? I mean, the short answer is I would say release notes. Um, certainly, MySQL is very good at this. Every release, if you go into the documentation, the first page in the documentation is what's new in MySQL, blah and it will give you a list of changes. OK, a lot of them you can just skim through, because like performance update, don't care, performance update, don't care, change in storage engine, yeah, whatever. But every now and again, you'll come across something that you'll be like, oh my god, that's amazing. Um, so that's the way I do it. I mean, even, uh, same for PHP. PHP, MySQL, those things, I will go and look at the what's new in version um, as my first stop. And if I find something that looks vaguely interesting, I'll then Google it and find out some more information. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Ah, oh, so close. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, so it was, thank you, because it was uh, inspirational. The whole tomorrow evening and Monday I will be evaluating whether it was a good decision to migrate our search engine two years ago to Elasticsearch. <laughs> and so the question is, what, apart, like speaking, for example, about Elasticsearch, so skipping aside full text search, yeah. So what what are the other guys saying? Yes. So the ones who um, develop Mongo, Elasticsearch. So what are these Elasticsearch or Mongo? Yes. In terms of JSON or geospatial searching, what are the advantages of Elasticsearch, for example? If uh, you skip aside like full text search. Yes, sure. So I mean, I mean, with any if 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 you're storing data in JSON, you know, just generally speaking. The ability to index it is going to be a major benefit. I must say I don't know an awful lot about Elasticsearch. Um, a good example, if you, if you want to do JSON searching, for example, and I'm going to really put a cat amongst the pigeons, is use Postgres. I love Postgres's, because uh, Postgres can, in, it's got a special, I can't remember the name of the index, now. there's a special index type in Postgres anyway, that can index an entire JSON column. I don't know how it works. It does some voodoo and wizardry. Uh, I'm sure someone else can probably explain it far better than voodoo and wizardry. Um, but I'm a big fan of, of, of post, Postgres and the way it does handles JSON and indexing and things like that. I know that's not the answer you wanted, um, but with any of these things, I build some test cases. Yes, it can be small scale. You can't realistically you know, put all your data into Elasticsearch and Postgres and something else, but you can do some small subsets of things that happen commonly and, and, and basically run some experiments and, and go from there. 
Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> Anyone else? Otherwise, you get an early coffee break. That should mean. So you. I have other, <laughs> uh, other. Qu can I have other question? So because, uh, as I understand, what was your goal? You was goal was to inspire us to follow the changes, or specifically speak about MySQL? Because the first one, of course, was achieved. And in terms of the second one, specifically speaking about MySQL, do you like see any? Arguments like against using those features, yes, because for example, like this invisible uh, mode of changing yeah, indices, indices, yes, yeah. it's like probably it's somehow contradictory to this whole infrastructure as code movement or evolutionary databases where you create the copy of data in parallel and to test like real mm. how it like it's yeah, in so, reality so how it performs. I mean, with all these things, you know. Do I, would I say that any of, if you've already got a stack using Postgres or Mongo or whatever else, would any of these things convince me to scrap all that and move to MySQL? Possibly not. Um, the one thing I do love, certainly with the JSON columns now, is that you can kind of get the best of both worlds, so you can still have your relational data. Um, you know, like w we do, uh, obviously at work, we have products and, and they have some meta, they have some kind of what we'd co consider core columns like n a name and a price, but then some other metadata that might not matter. Now MySQL now gives us the, the, the ideal way of doing it because we can have our relational data and it can relate to an account and it can have a relation to a, a server and, and whatever else, but then all this other meta stuff that we just throw into a JSON, op, you know, a JSON column and worry about it later. The point of this talk really is to say whatever you're using, go and look at the things that perhaps if, if, if you've not looked at the new things, yes, you might have updated for security reasons, but if you've actually not looked at what comes with the new versions, whatever you're using, go and do it. But equally, I would imagine a lot of us are using MySQL for something, whether it's you know, your main product at work or a side project or whatever else. And a lot of these things will make, make your lives better. You know, by, by able to, you know, with the index example, being able to test, does it matter if I turn this index off or not? Um, and that just... And so, if you're using MySQL, look at some of these things. But whatever you're using, go and go and you know, see what's what's shiny and new. <laughs> cool. Let's go and have coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>